neighbors is really struggling. The other guy, for example, on the program, he was basically an elderly, not elderly, he was probably in his 50s, close to maybe 60s. He's been a you know, working class person his entire life, having worked all his life and never having claimed any money. So he is, the doctor had diagnosed him with, uh, with a, you know, that basically he's got a bad heart and that he should no longer work. And despite him showing everything to, to the job center, they were refusing to give him any money whatsoever. So one, they were saying that you've got to basically apply for job seekers allowance. He was basically applying for job seekers allowance while he's telling them that he's not allowed to work. So he's having to go out and look for work and pretend that he's looking for work. And even when he's offered a job, he has to tell the employer, well, he can't work because the doctor's told him he can't work. So, you know, you find a lot of difficulties with regards to the society that we live in. And there's a lot of people that are really struggling out there. And what I think is important is to realize that, you know, from this is Islam enables us to basically have a close relationship with our neighbors, to help our neighbors, to help the community around us. And it brings uh, strong communities, strong neighbors. Uh, strong communities, even for example, if you have neighborhood to watch in your area, it can help prevent crime, etc., etc., drugs. It can help children in that area in terms of you providing some services to them potentially. There's lots and lots of benefits. A uh, perfect example is now that it's snowing, for example. I remember last year where I was living, all of the neighbors, they were coming out and helping, for example, clear every, every other neighbor's garden, clear it with the, the twigs and the branches that had fallen from the trees, etc. So there's a lot of benefits from this, which Islam also encourages for us not just to think about ourselves, but also to think about the wider community, especially those that are close to us in terms of the neighbors, but then also those beyond as well. Also, we mentioned with regards to the guest and being good to the guest, and this is something we mentioned that especially it seems to be, unfortunately, that the more that time goes on, the more that we seem to be losing these characteristics which we learned from our um, forefathers, from our parents, etc. And we mentioned, I know from my parents, for example, they are very always prepared for the guest. For example, we have a lot of relatives that are live further out in the country, that when they come down south and they come to live, we norm they normally used to have several blankets, etc., that they had prepared and they would bring out if neighbors came. Whereas in our times, it seems to be that we're not as welcoming to the guests um, in this regard. So these are important uh, points that we should try to um, learn from and we should try to be um, going out and trying to introduce ourselves to the neighbors, giving them guests, so that if they are in help or in need, um, then they know where to come to and they have some sort of support. For example, you might find a neighbor, I know where I live, in one of the five houses is just an old elderly lady. She's probably in her 90s. So, you know, she, you know, I, you know, I've gone to see her and said to her, look, you know, we're available to you, for example, if you need help. Even if they don't come to you, they really, really appreciate the kind words and they feel that, you know, we are as Muslims, we're able to, you know, provide them with whatever support they need. Okay, we will move on to um, hadith number 16. An Abi Hurairah radiyallahu an, anna rajulan qala lin nabiyy sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, awsini, qala la taghdab, faraddada miraran qala la taghdab, rawaw al-Bukhari. So Abu Hurairah narrates from the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that a man came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he said, advise me. And the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said to him, La taghdab, don't get angry. And again he repeated the question many times. And again the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept answering him by saying, don't get angry. So obviously we learn from this hadith the importance generally of not becoming angry. So the first question that we must ask ourselves is anger, is it always something which is bad? Or are there actually cases where being angry or becoming angry are okay? So the so scholars, they discussed, is it part of the human nature to actually become angry? Is something inherent within us so no one can really avoid it? Or is it something that we can actually remove altogether? The majority of scholars, they said, it is something that is inherent within us. We can't actually get rid of this anger whatsoever. And actually, in reality, there is a form of anger which is of good, 
but it shouldn't be acted on. Meaning you shouldn't, for example, you for example, you see something which is evil, again, for example, against Allah and the Messenger, which contradicts the Quran and the Sunnah, and you see someone doing something which is really bad, you should hate that thing in your heart. And you should try to, in terms of actions, I mean in terms of a bad response, and uh, in terms of an insightful response, you should be calm, and you should deal with that situation and that anger, and that bad thing that's happening in a positive mindset. In terms of trying to change it in a positive way. So anger is something which can be good if it is for Allah and His Messenger in terms of trying to um, enjoin that which is good and forbid that which is evil and disliking that which displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, any other type of anger in terms of general in discussions, in terms of a situation where you should not become angry, and we will talk of some of those situations, then these are bad. And it is something, one, we should try to stop that feeling as much as possible of anger. But when it does actually come, then we should try to ensure that we behave and are able to control that anger as much as possible, as we will discuss. Second point worth mentioning here is, who is the tough one? Is the tough guy really the one who he shouts the loudest and he wins in an argument or the one who wrestles the other one and he beats his opponent in a fight, for example? Is it the loudest one? Sometimes you will listen to a debate, for example, between two people and it always appears to us actually the one that wins is the one that's been loudest or the one that talks the most. Whereas if you really look at their arguments, actually you will find actually the one that was quieter potentially, he, was, uh, he had better points. And he actually won the argument. So as the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, لَيْسَ شَدِيدُ بِسُرْعَةً إِنَّمَا الشَّدِيدُ الَّذِي يَمْلِكُ نَفْسَهُ إِنْدَ الْغَدَبِ That the strong one is not the one who wrestles, is not the one who brings the other one to the ground. But the strong one in reality is the one who controls himself when he becomes angry. So we from the Sharia perspective, we will get angry for sure at times, but we must control this anger. And that is the one that is successful. Not the one who is more muscular. Not the one that beats the other one down. Not the one that shouts the loudest. Not the one that potentially hits someone. And these are very important. We don't just mention them for the sake of mentioning. We find that anger is a result, is a cause of many of the uh, issues that we find in common society. Whether that be domestic violence, whether that be crime, whether that be people, the people that have ended up in prison. If you talk to a lot of people that ended up in prison or you visit the prisons, you will find that most of the people that end up there generally may have been okay and good people, but they ended up doing something in a rage of anger. Maybe they were in a relationship and they ended up hitting their wife, for example, or they, for example, lashed out at one of their family because they were drunk, for example, or something really serious happened in the family and they couldn't control themselves, etc., etc., etc. So this anger is a big problem in society and the one that can control his anger, there is much good for him. And he will not fall into doing something that he will later regret or he will feel sorry about. The third thing that we learn from the hadith is the importance of the student of knowledge or the one that doesn't know something to ask the people that know. So the man, he came to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he says to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, Awsini. And we find many, many um, different narrations where the Sahaba radiallahu anhum ajma'een have come to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and they have asked him for advice. That they're always keen to learn, always wanting to know that which, as it uh, says here, sahabati ala ma yanfa. That basically the desire of the companions to always learn about those things which will benefit them. So they always come to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam. Oh, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, teach me something that will benefit me. Oh, Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, give me advice. And the one that is the student of knowledge and he knows someone that maybe is more learned to him, that person should go to that person and ask that person for advice. 
Because if you are trying to learn or you're having some struggles, you will generally find that other people have been through those similar problems. And especially the teacher, he will have seen many students that are mainly facing the, maybe the same struggles that you have. Maybe you're trying to memorize Quran and you don't know how to memorize the Quran. The teacher will be able to help you. Maybe you have a personal problem, but because the person of knowledge, he discusses the similar issues with many, many people. He can advise you both from a shari'i perspective and also from a practical perspective. So as we said, the companions, they always wanted to learn. They always wanted some pertinent advice. They always wanted to improve themselves. And they took advice without being emotional. And likewise, we learn, as we mentioned, we will come later, the Prophet ﷺ is also not becoming emotional. So the, Prophet, the man is asking the question, yet the Prophet ﷺ is giving him a response, and he keeps asking the same question. It's like not only does he, either he wants two situations. One, he wants the Prophet ﷺ to give him something more. He doesn't feel that, oh, just because, okay, I'm not going to become angry. He sees it as some small advice. So he's asking the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, hoping that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi will give him more. Or, you know, he wants to learn something extra. He doesn't feel it's big enough. Or maybe he's even seeking affirmation, knowing that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam likes to sometimes repeat something if he knows that it's something very important, knowing maybe the Prophet Sallallahu will give him the same advice again and again and again. And that will make him realize how important this advice is. Number four. The teacher should never be stingy or never hold back with regards to answering the questions that are asked by the student. Again, we find, as I mentioned before, all of the narrations where somebody is coming to the Prophet wasallam and they're asking the Prophet wasallam, tell me about that which will benefit me. Tell me about a word which will lead me to paradise. Advise me with regards to this or advise me with regards to that. You never find a narration where the Prophet wasallam says, I'm not going to give you any advice. Just doesn't happen. So this is from... The, the great things that we learn from the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, as we learned also in hadith of Jibra'il Alaihi Salam, that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam always used to sit with the companions. He was always approachable to the companions. He always wanted to give them advice, whether it be general advice when they were sitting together, or advice which was pertinent to the individual person. So this is again, for the teacher should always listen, and he should give advice which is relevant. To focus on something small. So sometimes the Prophet ﷺ, he's not saying much to him. Maybe the Prophet ﷺ has seen something specifically in this companion, or he's just highlighting something very small, which will bring about a huge benefit. Sometimes the Prophet ﷺ, out of his wisdom, sometimes you see a person that even though he's doing great things, there's something in his life which is contradicts the book and the sunnah, and that one thing that he does, he's not able to identify it. But the believer to a believer is like a mirror. He sees that one thing. When you find that one thing that person is doing wrong, then that person, the doors of knowledge and the doors of mercy open for that person. Like we know from the scholars of the past, the past, if they were trying to identify a ruling with regards to something and they wouldn't come to them that what is the correct ruling, they would either go and pray to Nuwafil, for example, or they used to make istighfar of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, or they used to basically think about what is the sin that I have done that is preventing me from attaining the reality of this issue. To always be available. So the person of knowledge should always be available to the people and having concern for the Muslims. And as we covered the hadith previously, الدِّينُ النَّسِيحَ لِلَّهِ وَلِكِتَابِهِ وَلِرَسُولِهِ وَلِأَئِمَّةِ الْمُسْلِمِينَ وَأَمَّتِهِمْ That when basically the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, the religion is sincere advice, or is, yes, is sincere advice to whom they asked the companions, the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam said to Allah, to his book, to his messenger, to the leaders of the Muslims and to the general folk. So more so the person of knowledge, he is responsible of giving good advice.
Point number five. The importance of being patient with the student. So again here from this hadith we know that the man as I was saying before he keeps asking the question. The Prophet ﷺ doesn't say to him you already asked me this question go away. The man's asking again and again and again and again the Prophet ﷺ is calmly say, saying to him La taghtab, don't become angry. One emphasizing the point to him and number two he's being very patient with him. He's not showing any frustration that the fact that the person is asking the same question again and again. Sometimes in our times especially, we have very short tempers. And the, maybe the people of knowledge or the person you're asking the question, he has too many things to do. He's impatient with the people. Either or, with, or perhaps he thinks that the thing that he's asking is so simple to understand. When the Prophet ﷺ is saying to him, don't become angry, it's a very simple thing. So either, like I said, he wanted something more or he wanted to hear it again and again. And the Prophet ﷺ, out of his wisdom, gave the same advice again and again and again. So he would understand that when he goes away, also when you repeat something many, many times, it stays with the person. If you say it once, the person will give it less importance. If you say it more and more, it will stick with the person. And as Allah says in the Quran, إِنَّ اللَّهَ مَعَ الصَّابِرِينَ that verily Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, He is with those that are patient. So as we said, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam repeated the advice despite being asked the question repeatedly. The man wanted something more, as though the advice was not big enough. Sometimes we have a trait which blocks us from attaining the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And again, maybe the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam uh, was mentioning because the scholars they mention that the person who this was many scholars they try to discuss who was the person that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was talking to and Shaykh Uthaymin rahimahullah ta'ala he says this is not important but what they a lot of the scholars they say is that it was known about this particular sahaba that he had a problem with regards to anger not agreed upon but this is a group of the scholars they said this is known about this person and this is why the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was giving this specific specific advice to him. As I said, sometimes you have a quality or a trait which is preventing you from Jannah or is preventing you from attaining much higher levels with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And maybe out of the wisdom of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we can take the benefit that if in your brother you find some weakness and you see that is blocking him, whether something in the dunya or the akhirah, then basically you can pinpoint that thing, it will open doors of greatness for that person and allow him to flourish. Point number six, giving specific advice relevant for the individual. So again, as we said, some of the scholars, they mentioned that this particular Sahabi, he had an issue with regards to anger. So the Prophet ﷺ focused on this. So if a man comes to you who you know is involved in a riba, then it's pertinent for you to mention something about riba. If a man comes to you and you know that he breaks the ties of kinship, then it's pertinent for you to tell him not to break the ties of kinship. If a man comes to you and he doesn't pray, then it's important for you to tell him to pray. And if a man comes to you who is not Muslim, then it's pertinent for you to tell him about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So every individual case requires a different response and from the wisdom of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was to address every situation in the right way as allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in surah an-nahl invite to the way of your lord with wisdom and good instruction and argue with them in a way that is best so this is from the wisdom of the prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and most, peop most people, unfortunately, this wisdom is hard to gain. And the wise one is the one who knows this. That everyone, when he asks him a question, he knows how to address the person with regards to the specific question that he's trying to ask. First, he's trying to understand what is the angle that the person's coming from. Or what is the problem that the person is facing. And then to address that specific problem. Rather than always just giving a general advice.
Number seven. Ibn Rajab, he mentions that there are two key purposes behind the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam mentioning the need to control anger. What are the two important things? Number one, he mentions that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam calls to all good characteristics, as we said. And we mentioned some of the loving for your brother, what you love for yourself, being good to the neighbor, being good to the guest, all guest always speaking good, being kind having forbearance, being shy, having humanity, having, being forgive, uh, forgiving, etc., etc. All of these are qualities that are good and encouraged by the Sharia. And likewise, this of not becoming angry is a major thing from the characteristics of the Muslim. It was said to Ibn, Ibn Mubarak, he was, he was asked, اِجْمَعْ لَنَا حُسْنُ الْحُلُقِ فِي كَلِمَةٍ he said he was asked, the people asked him, give us one word which encompasses all of good character. And he said, Tarqul Ghadab, the avoiding becoming angry. So again, we will repeat it. Ibn al Mubarak, he was asked, Ijma' lana husnul khuluqi fi kalimatin. He was asked, gather for us a word or bring to us a word, or bring us something which encompasses all of good characteristics, all of husnul khuluq, all of good manners in one word. And he said, Tarqul ghadab, leaving off becoming angry. Because a person could be the best of people when he's calm, the nicest of people, good manners, good knowledge, good etiquettes. But when anger comes, then he ruins all of that because he can't control himself. So a person needs to train himself to not become angry. It's not something, unfortunately, that comes naturally. It is something that you need to strive at. It is something that you need to struggle with. As we will come, because this is the tool that shaitan uses. He comes to the one that comes, becomes angry and he whispers to the one that becomes angry to incite him towards evil. And this shaitan, he comes to every single person. Irrelevant of the person is knowledgeable or not knowledgeable. Whether the person is kind or not kind. He will come to every single one of us. And secondly, Ibn Rajab, he mentions the importance of even though you will become angry, that to control one's anger. To not be overcome by it but to fight oneself so that it does not spread, meaning you don't act upon it. You don't do something which you will later regret. You do not say something which you will later regret. And we will come to how to attain this level. How will we ensure that we're not going to angry, get angry? How are we going to ensure that we control this anger and this fire which comes to us when we become angry? The word anger also comes in the Qur'an with regards to the story, it's mentioned twice, especially specifically with regards to the story of Musa alayhi salam. When Musa alayhi salam, he says to his people that I'm going to go away for 30 days plus 10 days. So he leaves them for 40 days, going to talk to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives him some tablets or some inscriptions to go back and advise his people that when he returns to his people, he finds them having taken a calf or having made, for using their ornaments, having made a calf for, the, for worshipping. And the Quran says that Musa alayhi salam, he became ghadban asifa. He became very angry and sorry and sad grieving and he was upset that he says in the quran that he threw the inscriptions on the floor and he was very upset with them and he said to his brother harun that let's go and make a forgiveness to allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and then basically after that it says Lamma sakat musa -ghadab. and then when musa he calmed down and his anger calmed down he was able to return to his duty of calling the people to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. 
So for sure, we know even from the messengers they were affected by this thing. That in the situation of rage, shaitan came to Musa alayhi salam and the reaction of Musa alayhi salam was almost like, forget these people, leave them all together. I have nothing to do with them. I will not give them any message. Then when he calms down, he realizes that, no, he has a, he has a bigger duty. He must call them to that which is right. So again, it is something that will happen. And the best one is the one that can control the anger and calm the anger. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, وَإِذَا مَا غَدِبُوهُمْ يَغْفِرُونَ That who are the good people? They are the ones that when they become angry, they are still forgiving. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَالْكَاذِمِينَ الْغَيْظِ وَالْعَافِينَ عَنِ النَّاسِ وَاللَّهُ يُحِبُّ الْمُحْسِنِينَ and those that basically they can control their anger or they can suppress their anger and they are forgiving to the people and Allah loves those who are good. So this characteristic of anger, the one that can control it and suppress it and still be forgiving and still be calm, that person will never get himself into trouble. And it's worth mentioning some real examples, especially maybe between the husband and the wife. This is much cause of the reason that many partners, they end up getting divorced. Sometimes it's the smallest of issues, but because you're enraged, you will go and say something out of anger that basically ruins the relationship, destroys the relationship. So the best one is that when he becomes angry, he controls the anger, he removes himself from that situation. Point number eight. There is something that shaitan uses to come to the individual and incite him towards that which displeases Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So anger is one of the tools of shaitan. And Imam al-Tirmidhi him narrates, anger is like a live coal which is in the heart of mankind which shaitan comes and he ignites it. So as, we, he is, so as we said, some of the scholars, they said this anger is something which is part of our nature. It's not something that we can remove altogether. So it's like a live coal which is inside us. That when even something small happens which upsets us, shaitan comes and he lights that fire. He said, that's it, you can't take this. How did that person, he said this to you? Can you take it? He wants you to do something out of rage. He wants you to maybe swear by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Maybe he wants you to curse Allah. Well, maybe, so he will start with that which is biggest and then he will come down. He wants to destroy the family. He wants to destroy the relationship between the husband and the wife. If he can destroy that relationship, he destroys the home. So every label shaitan is coming and he's trying to incite this person to say something, to do something, to act upon his anger. As Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Quran, Inna shaytana lakum aduun fattakhiduhu aduwa. That verily shaytan is to you an open enemy. So take him as an enemy. Realize that when you, even when we get angry, the first thing that you should realize is straight away that shaytan is going to come to me straight away. Let me cool down. If we have that emphasis straight away, it will make us calm. Remembering Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at that point of anger is the foremost thing that will make you calm and relaxed. And as Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, following on in the same verse, إِنَّمَا يَدْعُوا حِزْبَهُ لِيَكُونُوا مِنْ أَصْحَابِ السَّعِيرِ That verily shaitan, he only calls his party so that they can become from the people of the hellfire. Point number nine, the importance of repetition. So we learn from the hadith that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, out of his wisdom, he repeated the answer several times. And this helps with a number of things. 
Number one with memorization. That if you read hadith once, and you just keep reading the hadith on and on, I guarantee if you go home and you're trying to read, for example, one chapter of Sahih al-Bukhari, and you just read one following on, next, 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 by the time you come to the end, you will forget on all the ones you read at the beginning. But the one who repeats something once, twice, three times, four times, five times, etc., that person, the hadith, and whatever he is memorizing, will stay with him. Number two, that not only will he memorize it in the mind, it will then be something which is instilled within his heart. And this is the more important thing. It's less important just to memorize. But more important is once the person has memorized it and he faces situations in his daily life and he recalls these ahadith, it becomes something which becomes part of his character. That person becomes... Like when Aisha radiallahu an asked about the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, what is his character? And she, Aisha radiallahu anha, said his character is that of the Qur'an. And that is what we seek to get. This repetition, the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam always used to repeat something when he wanted the people to pay attention to the importance of that matter. And actually Imam al-Bukhari rahimahullah ta'ala, he brings a hadith, Specifically mentioning this. He says in uh, Anas ibn Malik narrates that the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam would repeat himself three times. When he delivered any statements, he wanted to be understood. And when he was visiting people, he would also give them salam three times. So if there's many people, for example... Maybe first time some people will not respond or whatever. The Prophet ﷺ gave importance to saying things or doing things three times when he wanted to emphasize that this thing is very, very important. And this narration is in Bukhari. And specifically with regards to this issue, the Prophet ﷺ said, إِذَا غَدِبَ أَحَدُكُمْ فَلْيَسْقُتْ so the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, when one of you becomes angry, he should remain silent. And the narrator then says, he said it three times. And point number 10, the evil effects of anger. Al-Hasan al-Basari, he mentions... There are four characteristics. If one has them, Allah will protect him from the hellfire. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will protect him from shaitan and will make the hellfire forbidden for him. The one who controls four things. List the four things. The one that can control these things then that person, shaitan, will not overcome him and the hellfire will be forbidden for him. Number one, craving. So when he desires something, he craves for something and he can control that thing. Number two, in a situation of fear. So when a person is scared of something, he's naturally going to end up normally doing something that he wouldn't normally do. The one that he can control his emotions when he craves for something, when he fears something. Number three, when he lusts for something. And specifically in our times, in the societies that we live, where everything is made so glamorous to us, merchandise, products, the opposite sex, this is something that is very important. The one that can control his lusts and his desires, that person will be successful. And lastly, the one who can control his anger. And Ibn, oh, I think it comes next. and Ibn Rajab, he mentions a narration from Imam Ahmad, rahimahullah ta'ala, where Imam Ahmad mentions the statement of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, فَإِذَا الْغَدَبُ يَجْمَعُ الشَّرَّ كُلَّهُ Sorry, this is a statement of the Prophet, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This is about the actual story itself. 
So this hadith, the man that came to the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam asking for advice, and then the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, because he repeated it, the man in one narration it stated that when he walked away, he realized as though the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam was saying to him that anger encompasses all evil. That's why he wanted to emphasize it to him so much. That if he can control this anger, then all good will become open to him. And then we find many statements from the Salaf similar to this, where they say the anger is the root of all evil. We've got five minutes, so we'll try and uh, mention quickly. So point number 11. How does one now control his anger? There are a number of things that we learn from the book and the sunnah, or from the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that as we said, a person naturally at times he will become angry. So, how do we prevent this anger? Actually, what I will do is we will carry on next lesson. I will ask uh, if anybody has uh, any questions with regards to the previous hadith we discussed or this hadith because we didn't have an opportunity last time also. So if there's anything that wasn't clear, anything that you want to ask, uh, and then we'll carry on with the hadith um, next time, inshallah. Has anybody got any questions? Tafadila uh, Sheikh. Hassan al said, uh, the one who controls cravings and controls lusts, what would be the difference between, so what would, uh, would uh, craving be? I think Allah, if you look at a lust, it can just be something even you have experienced it the first time. Whereas craving is something that is uh, ongoing, it's something that is there all the time. Any other questions? Nope. Okay, maybe we'll use the last few minutes then. Oh, sorry, brother. Lust, anger, fear. Okay, I think Uncle wants to give the adhan, so inshallah we will uh, stop there. The last thing I'll mention from last week while we were mentioning, um, there were a number of narrations about, uh, I think, the traveler, etc., and, uh, et and the guests, and also with regards to um, the traveler, and with regards to the importance of being kind to the neighbor, and who is the neighbor. I think basically Sheikh Uthaymin, he says that the strongest opinion, although we found all of these opinions with regards to is it 40 houses to the left and the right and 40 houses in front and behind, is it one house, etc. He said that the best view is what is the urf of the people. The urf means what do generally people consider to be the neighbor. So if you ask your neighbors who is the neighbor, they may say it's five houses to the left and right, etc. Normally the people in their own community, they can decide what is a neighbor? The, the important thing here is not to take the number of houses, but the importance of looking after your neighbors, looking out for them, visiting them, giving them gifts. And I hope that from these lessons, we can take practical lessons. There's no point, as we say, that we learn these things, but practically we do nothing. I really hope that between this week and next week, or last week and this week, somebody went out and they went and helped their neighbors. Especially we know now that it's going to snow a lot in the next week. Well, we don't know, but it's predicted. Yeah, that it will snow a lot in the next week. So this is a great opportunity to visit the neighbors and see if they need any help. Maybe you can go out on the weekend and help them clear their snow or do something for them. Uh, we will end on that note, inshallah. Rabbana atina fi dunya hasana wa fil akhirati hasana wa qina adhaban nar.